Haiti is a very, 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 very important uh, island in uh, the Pan-African struggle. Haiti uh, brings pride to Africans who know history. In 1803, Haiti was the most democratic country in the world. It was the only country in the world that did not allow slavery on its borders. The only country in the world in 1803. Once you properly understand this history, because you know these uh, capitalist pigs have such a way of making it appear as if we've never done anything as Africans. We don't know democracy. And we don't know democracy. In 1803, Africans gave the freest world, the freest nation to the entire world. The only country in the world that did not allow slavery was Haiti. And not only did not allow it, but the only country in the world that put its natural resources towards fighting against any oppression was Haiti. Simon Bolivar who liberated South America. Anyone who knows the history knows it was Haiti that gave him the money, outfitted him with ships to start the struggle. And the Haitians demanded only one thing of Bolivar. When you free Venezuela, when you free Colombia, when you free Argentina, when you free Peru, free the slaves. The only condition of which they required of Simon Bolivar. This is history. You can't hide the truth, and if you know your history, you look for history, you will find it. You can imagine the threat that history imposed, that Haiti imposed upon America since 1803. There was nothing that American imperialism, one other thing I must tell you. From this period, 1803, Haiti fought every major European power, the Americans, the French, the Spanish, the Germans, the Portuguese, all of them, trying to bring Haiti down, and not one of them could make Haiti renege on her democratic principles. On that country, there would never be on that territory a slave. Every man, every woman was free. You just make it to Haiti and you're free. No slavery. Everywhere else there was slavery. Everywhere else. In the great America, they were, let's not talk about that. So anyway, you could imagine the threat that Haiti posed. American imperialism, all of its life, had only one objective, to bring those slaves back onto the plantation. There was only one objective, bring those slaves back to the plantation. And America, France, all of them could not bring Haiti back to the plantation. Even after slavery was uh, made illegal throughout the Western Hemisphere and was even abandoned and emancipation proclamations were read everywhere, Haiti continued to be the guiding inspiration for Africans throughout the Western Hemisphere. It was not until 1915 that American imperialism could put the heels of the Marines on Haiti, install Papa Doc, a scum of our race, one who would bow down to the wishes of imperialism and rape his people without the slightest mercy. And since then, that's where Haiti has been. And that's where it is to this day. And it's certainly not Bill Clinton who's going to liberate it, just the masses of Africans. The organization that the Honorable Marcus Garvey foresaw for us in the Universal Negro Improvement Association will be, Universal Negro Improvement Association will be a reality. If you look everywhere, you will see the conditions being stacked properly for Africans to begin organization. And if you look at our struggle, one thing about our struggle, one of its characteristics, while spontaneous, is that it spreads like wildfire. I mean, when you look at our struggle, it shocks you. You know, like a sit-in movement starts in, uh, or you can go back before that. A bus Montgomery, a Montgomery bus boycott starts in 1954, right, in uh, Alabama. Do you know within six months there's a nonviolent bus boycott in South Africa, Azania, led by uh, Chief Lefouli of the African National Congress. Now just to show you how fast it spreads, three sitting students get arrested February 1st in Greensboro, North Carolina. By the end of February, 3,000 students will be arrested. We, when we start something, we are so oppressed that once the light is seen, everybody reacts. Look at the independence movement in Africa. In 1957, Kwame Nkrumah led the way with the independence of Ghana. They laughed. He was different from the others. By 1960, two-thirds of Africa would be independent. It would sweep the Caribbean. Within six years, to by 1966, practically all territories of Africans would be liberated, except the, the stubborn ones, like Azania, South Africa, Namibia in the past, the Portuguese ones, where they were defeated, and where they will be defeated, etc., etc. If you look at rebellions in this country, even just recently, in 1965, the first one started in Watts. By 1968, 300 cities would burn in this country under the torch of angry Africans. We have, in our character of struggle, not only is it spontaneous, but once it starts, it spreads like wildfire. 
and we have all the conditions and all the milieu prepared now for organization. Once we begin to organize, it will spread like wildfire. The enemy encourages that. So, for example, if we would look at the situation of Africans in America, if we don't look at the enemy, we'll say, well, look at them, you know, they're so dirty, they're on drug addicts, they're just killing each other, you know. For example, brother told me, you know, oh, Charles Willis is that, we're just killing each other. I said, where? He said, in Chicago. I said, where else? Yes, in Los Angeles. And where else? And, uh, and uh, in New York. I said, where else? And in Florida. And uh, where else? And, uh, and in Philadelphia. I said, and then where else? He said, well, all over America. I said, where else? He said, well, all over America. I said, where else? I said, how about Azania, South Africa? He said, well, yeah, that's true, too. I said, how about Brazil? He said, well, I don't know much about that. I said, well, look down there. Well, we look, you see us fighting each other. So uh, if you're just looking at us and you're looking at the enemy, you can make no analysis at all, none whatsoever. As a matter of fact, your analysis is completely faulty. It's one-sided. It's, 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 it's just, it's just the, the analysis of the enemy. That is our fault, not the fault of the enemy. The reason why we're not organized is because of the enemy, capitalism, racist capitalism. It understands that once the African masses are organized, it is finished. Simply because if you look at, and I'm not saying this just because I'm re rhetoric, it's historical fact. If you look at the African masses, you will see we struggle all the time, even if spontaneously. You understand? When you think we're finished, Jack, out of nowhere, we'll come up. We've had, from, we've burnt this country from, from plantations to cities. You understand? So this is no struggle to play with. These people are serious, but their struggle has never been an organized struggle, only a spontaneous struggle. And the enemy knows that since we must struggle, we will struggle, he must do everything to keep the struggle at least a spontaneous struggle. Do you know what will happen when we are organized and we rise up in Los Angeles as we did in April with organization? I mean, when you think about it, that wasn't even planned. You know, they just, oh, man, this is too far, right? These, they're going too far. Let's get them this time. Once again, they just think we just ain't nobody. Let's go get them. Everybody's just decided on the spur of the moment. Have you ever heard of the people deciding to revolt against the major power in the world on the spur of the moment? <laughs> you better not play with these people. Because <laughs> when they organize, they'll take it hands down. So the lack of organization is the enemy. Thus, all these games that are playing in uh, Africa is nothing but the same petty bourgeois elements making believe they're fighting against each other to fool the people to let them think that there's some progress coming. But it's getting harder to fool the people today because consciousness rises all the time, and the people's consciousness is rising. All that is happening now in Africa is only the preparation of the ground for unified Africa. We are revolutionaries, and if we're not revolutionaries, we understand the process of history. There is no example of human advancement which has been made anywhere in the world without the shedding of blood. None. <coughs> Even Martin Luther King, with all of his nonviolence, had to shed his blood in order to advance the cause. Thus the statement is clear, must be properly understood. There is no advancement of human progress anywhere in the world without the shedding of blood. So when blood is being shed, we don't get upset. We just want to know what purpose is it being shed for. That's what we're concerned with. A capitalism has an idea of making it appear as if Africans are incapable of ruling themselves from Liberia to Somalia. But those of us who understand what is going on there tell all of them the blood that is being spilt in Liberia, the blood that is being spilt in Somalia is only going to cement a unified socialist Africa. That's clear. So all of these attempts are failing. You can see it clearly here in America. In 1965, when our brothers and sisters rose up in Watts, Africans had no political visibility in this country at all. I mean, in 1965, when we rose up in Watts, a racist pig, Yorty, was mayor. In 1992, Tom Bradley was mayor, an African. From 1965 to 1992, great reforms were in America, undeniably so. In 1965, we had no mayors to speak of. In 1992, we have over 320 mayors throughout this country. And they're mayors of the biggest cities in this country, New York, Newark, Washington, Philadelphia, um, Birmingham, Los Angeles, etc., etc., etc. So it is clear here. But all of these changes, all of these changes have had no effect on the quality of life of the masses of our people. On the contrary, the conditions are worse. What it does is that after you wage a mass rebellion in Watts, since it is, of course, spontaneous, but it inflicts heavy damages upon the enemy in every level, especially on the international political level, and the enemy's job is to make sure this rebellion doesn't occur again. They're not concerned about changing the conditions of life of the people. 
So what they want to do is to bring individuals who they put in position like a Tom Bradley and the masses is to assume that because Tom Bradley is there, everything is cool, everything will change. So all these reforms which have been made, all the Africans have said to America in 1992, whether anyone recognizes or not, is that reform cannot solve our problems, only revolution will. Mm. Thus, 1992 was a clear mark for those who don't understand what's going on in this country. The Africans have instinctively said that reform is not the answer, only revolution is. And from now on, the revolution atmosphere will be made. You cannot make revolution unless you're organized. You can make reforms spontaneously. But you cannot make revolution unless you're organized. And this then becomes a real criticism against Jesse. Those who criticize Jesse for mobilization must criticize him for being a reformist. Therefore, they must be revolutionary. Because revolutionaries can't play with mobilization. Revolutionaries must be organized because they want the seizure of power. Reformists want to influence power. That's the difference. Jesse Jackson wants to influence the Democratic Party so that they could be nice. Me, I want to take power from my people where we're supposed to take power. I don't want to influence nobody. I want the power. So if I want the power, I don't come with little men station and say, hey, Clinton, do this, give us this, give us that. No. I say, Clinton, we got X number of Africans in the country. They voted for you. This is the X number of power I want. End of discussion. But there's no question, it's true. I mean, we don't even have to wait till there. We can go back even before in Chicago with the disciples and the Blackstone Rangers and the work of Fred Hampton. One of the reasons that Fred Hampton had to be assassinated was because he was bringing the Blackstone Ranger, the gang in Chicago, along with disciples, another gang in Chicago, which were rival gangs, together against the police. It is clear, but we don't even have to, we don't even have to go that far. Malcolm X is a living example. But all revolutionaries start this way. Even Mao Zedong has built his army off of bandit armies because they do have the courage. They are rebelling, but they don't have the sense of scientific rebellion. And they're just confused, that's all. Malcolm had no sense at all. He was totally confused, but he was rebelled. He had hatred for the capitalist system. When in jail, under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he began to channel his energy correctly. He began to see clearly. Their energies are not correctly channeled. They are channeled by the police. It's the police who spawn gangs in America. It's the police who bring drugs into the community. It's the police who control the drugs in the community. It's the police who organize Africans to sell drugs in the community, making it look like they are not involved in it. And certainly if it's not the police, they ought to resign because they don't know how to do their jobs. We've been having a lot of discussions with them. As a matter of fact, we did a video with the leadership of the Crips and the Bloods when they tried to come together two years ago, before the rebellion. And this constant work is being done. And that video is there. We had uh, their representatives come together. Of course, we told them the only way they will find unity is coming together to, to protect our community against racist police. Now, we even told them then the very guns which the police give to you, and it's the police who get these guns, you understand? Know, well, I used to be the honorary prime minister of the Black Panther Party. Before then, I worked in SNCC. And as a young man in SNCC, I was carrying a gun since about 1962. Yes, that was We were not violent publicly. <laughs> we told, we made that quite clear to everybody. <laughs> quite clear to everybody. You get me on a lonely road, come here, we busting caps on each other, Jack. <laughs> I'm not going out that way. That's Martin Luther King. I ain't Martin Luther King now. <laughs> yes, I'll be Martin Luther King when it's public. You and me down together. <laughs> so everybody in Snake was carrying guns. So from the time I was 1962, I've been collecting guns. When the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, the first Black Panther in this country, Black Panther Party in this country, had his election, we had to add guns. I was the one who was selected by SNCC to go to all the major cities to get young brothers and sisters with guns to come there. So I've been knowing what kinds of guns we can get in the African community. I mean, when I became, when I became Prime Minister, Honorary Prime Minister of the Black Panther Party, my job was to control precisely the two field marshals, the East Wing and the West Wing. They were the ones who had the guns. As a matter of fact, I've always understood instinctively in any organization, you must be where the guns are because that's where the power is. That's why Edwards Cleaver and Bobby Seale and Hillard could talk all that nonsense. They couldn't touch me because I was sitting on the guns. <laughs> I was sitting on the guns. <laughs> so I knew the guns in the Kapati. I knew how the guns, and I, I've been going through this community all my life. So I know the guns that I see in this community, I can never get. The police bring those guns in. Who's he submachine gun in the African community? How you get that? The kids don't even know how to get it. Oh, I bought it from someone. They don't even know how they got it. But I know these machine guns coming in here, these little, these guns, they're not, not the way you get them illegally. These guns are being pumped in. It's a planned program. It's understood. The enemy, all this pumping drugs only shows me that we're winning. Because the enemy is pumping these drugs, creating these divisions because of the rising conscience of the people. Because it's work for him. It's work. 
It's work. You got to stay up night, divide gangs, create gangs. I mean, it's work. I remember when Reagan, that's why I laughed at Los Angeles, uh, not Reagan, Bush. You don't know who you're playing with. Bush said when those betrayed uh, the uh, Soviet bloc, when they betrayed socialism and it uh, collapsed, he said, we have an ex uh, excess of CIA agents. We're going to send them into the uh, ghettos of this country. And Los Angeles was targeted. He sent them in nine months before the rebellion. <laughs> I wonder where they are now. <laughs> <laughs> they have the excess force. This is organized. So these gangs must be organized against the police. Against the police. Because the police are the front runners of the organized gangs in the country. And this is a plan, organized. What they want to do is to make the entire African community feel insecure. Insecure among each other. When they saw the feeling of comradery and solidarity that was developing in the 60s, you understand, they said, we've got to stop this quick. We've got to bring insecurity inside here so that when they see each other, they won't say, hey, brother, say, are you going to kill me? That's all. But uh, it ain't going nowhere. Jack is just going to make us stronger for the second round on them. Because victory is ours, no matter which way they come. <laughs> <laughs> the emergence of Malcolm X is because this came from the youth themselves. Those young kids in the conditions, looking for the truth of the situation, finding that they found Malcolm X. Martin Luther King was pushed on them, but they found Malcolm X. Once the enemy saw that they found Malcolm X, you understand, they thought they would now jump on Malcolm X and try and twist it, make it a fad, as in everything else. But uh, the rising class of the people will not allow it. They will make it a fad, but even while making it a fad, you hear every step of the way struggles against it. The resistance against it has never been like for any other fad. Everywhere you go, people are opposing it. This is Malcolm is this. Get Malcolm. Even when they see people on the streets, hey, brother, you wearing that X, you know who Malcolm is? You better know who Malcolm is. Yes. So the, the dialectical struggle inside our community, which is not picked up on the television camera, is what people are not seeing. Oh, you know, he went and actually don't even know what it's for. You know, that's what they be saying. To any, they, me and you sit in the train. We know Malcolm. A brother walk on the train with X. You know, I said, we don't know the brother. Yeah, man, you know what the trouble is? Everybody wearing this X. Don't nobody know who Malcolm is. Malcolm was a down brother, you understand, know, before he go. So all those who wearing the X must know the Malcolm, you understand? Know, so it's going to push more and more. And since we're having the milieu for proper organization, once that organization probably sets in, all that they're playing with is going to go against them. They're playing with it. I want to make that clear. They are playing with it, but uh, they will not be able to play with it because the resistance, the awareness is such today that they themselves buried it. And since they couldn't keep it from being buried, they think they would co-opt it, but they will not be able to do it because it came from the determination of the youth themselves struggling for the truth. Now, I will never say that progress is being made. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. Mm -hmm. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow, that the blow made. And they haven't even begun to pull a knife out, much less try and pull, uh, heal the wound. You have, have, you have they won't even admit the knife is there. All I want them to do is to read Malcolm X himself. Not what people said about Malcolm X, just read Malcolm himself. And if they can't read until they learn to read, listen to him. Because he's on records, he's on tapes. Just listen to Malcolm themselves. That's all they have to do. And the most important thing they must know about Malcolm X is that Malcolm X came from the depths and transformed himself to the heights. He came from the lowest depths to the highest heights. He was a criminal. He was a pimp. He was willing to sell African women, and he transformed himself to a man willing to give his life for a woman. So uh, the main thing they must know from Malcolm X is that they have the same responsibility to transform themselves from one who thinks only about themselves and living on the community from one who comes to defend the community, to take nothing from the community and to want to only give everything they can to the community. That's the most important lesson. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. There's no question that King was killed by the FBI. There's no question. <clears throat> Of course, you must understand people get confused. I mean, J. Edgar Hoover has a job. It's a scientific job, just like any other job. His job is to maintain the status quo. He worked very hard at this job, J. Edgar Hoover. You must understand it. Now, if people don't understand Hoover, you know, that's why they make mistakes, you know. Hoover worked very hard at this job. And uh, by the 1950s, he had everything uptight. I mean, the Communist Party was running for cover in this country. The Socialist Party was running for cover. I mean... He had everything everywhere he wanted. And the group that he didn't think about the least, the slaves, they're the ones who jumped up. <laughs> he wasn't even thinking about Montgomery. <laughs> he didn't even have Rosa Parks' telephone line bugged. <laughs> and she jumped up on him.
<laughs> and when she sat down, every African in this country stood up on their feet. And then he had one of the biggest problems he'd ever had in his entire life, a movement that would transform the status quo of America in an irreversible manner. That's what they did. So you can imagine J. Edgar Hoover. And J. Edgar Hoover was not stupid. He knew that King, you know, was the one who was doing this. He knew King with all his nonviolent rhetoric. He knew King with all of that. He knew King at heart was against injustice to the max. And he knew the capitalist system was unjust. So he knew King was his die-hard enemy. So Hoover is faced with a problem. King allows for other groups to spring up, like the Panthers, you know, and these other groups. But it's King who's making this possible. So he, Hoover, is now faced with a problem. Since King's been rising since the 50s, now it's the 60s. And look at the country. I mean, you know, and all of it is because of these Africans. And all of it is because of King and now the ones he brings. So Hoover has to make a decision, right, we have to stop this. And of course, his thinking is that the leaders do it. So, you know, the communist infiltrators got the leaders, so let's wipe them out. So Hoover, just like anybody else, will sit down, all right. There are people like Huey Newton. There are people like uh, Kwame Ture, people like uh, Jamin El Amil. You know, these we've got to kill, definitely. No question about it. They have to be killed. Uh, and then there's King. But he knew one thing about King. King was an honest man. And that's what messed with Hoover. Because Hoover would have done everything possible to corrupt King. But King could not be corrupted materially. That's what messed with him. Because King was a preacher. Could you imagine a preacher in the South not liking Cadillacs? <laughs> <laughs> you know you had to kill King then. <laughs> now I understand very clearly all the dialectics involved. People get confused in history. But the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was the first of the human rights organizations in this country to make its position against the war in Vietnam. Martin Luther King was not the first. We were. At that time I was the chairperson of SNCC. I understood instinctively that unless King made a position against the war in Vietnam, we would be isolated. So t SNCC had two tasks. One was to rapidly spread this anti-Vietnam sentiment among the masses of our people rapidly and give it a political uh, channel. And two, put moral, non-violent, unremitting pressure on King to take a position on Vietnam. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home, and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. King was a creative genius, and King's great contribution to us was not nonviolence, but he taught us how to face the enemy without fear. The problem in the South was that we were afraid to face the enemy, and King taught us how to face the enemy without guns. Once you teach a people how to face an enemy who's full of guns without guns, it don't take nothing to pick up a gun. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to Journal Graphics, 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203. To place a credit card order, call 1-800-TALK-SHOW.